thank you everybody and I hope you all enjoyed that wonderful meal which Maurice just talked about and are uh, and have slept well enough uh, and I would like to thank everybody again especially Rainer Bridget uh, to have invited me and uh, as I'm not a political scientist uh, I come from a very different approach. I'm actually a sociolinguist and discourse analyst, and in that way uh, I was given the topic of culture. Now culture is of course a huge topic. Uh, everything and nothing belongs into culture, and it's also very difficult to measure in the way that we have been seeing other parts and other dimensions of migration talked about yesterday. And in that way, my paper, which I put together, is a bit, also a bit fragmented because I tried to cover some aspects of this enormous field of culture. But of course, I think it's impossible and uh, would need to be sliced into you know, religion, history, and various dimensions because all of them actually would require an entire lecture or paper. So what I decided to do for this uh, half hour is to focus basically on two parts. Uh, one is belonging, non-belonging, and the culturalization of discourse. Under culturalization, I will get to that a bit later, I mean that uh, cultural issues are being politicized and are being used for political debates although they actually belong to a completely different area. Uh, so they're being instrumentalized. Uh, and that leads us to debates about values, uh, which we confront very much nowadays. And having taken uh, Reiner's uh, utterance or words yesterday seriously, that we're usually talking about the past. I mean, that's what social scientists do is that you know, years after things have happened, we start to study them and do samples and surveys, etc. I've decided to take one example which I've not put into the paper, which is the Burkini, uh, because that is uh, something which has just happened now and which is quite a good example, I think, of the culturalization uh, of discourse. And the second focus of my half hour will be the tensions between multilingualism and monolingualism. You all know that one of the basic and constitutive values of the European Union is multilingualism. We're all supposed to be multilingual, at least three if not four languages, etc., etc., but that only affects uh, the languages of the member states, but not the migrant languages. So there is a big difference between languages. We call that hegemonic multilingualism. And uh, so I want to talk about this tension between multilingualism and monolingualism and the question of what kind of language do migrants have to or are required to learn and what are the gatekeeping factors. And specifically, I will just summarize very briefly one study which is just being done in, in conducted in Vienna, which actually shows that social class and social milieu uh, override migration background. Uh, and I think that is a very important factor that we shouldn't always divide samples into people with migrant backgrounds and people who are the autochtonic and real citizens of a country, but that there are other dimensions which cut across. Okay, so just to map out this enormous field of culture, uh, I would just like to list a few uh, dimensions which would all really require uh, huge studies in, in themselves. Uh, one of my really big interests is uh, what happens in our migrant societies and refugee societies when people with different traumas come and sort of confront people who are living there who also have different collective memories and histories and traumatic experiences. They don't know ours and we don't know theirs. And how that has to be sort of uh, bridged. I think 
basically I'm just putting together a project now about this for school materials because I think this is an enormous and important uh, issue. You have different communities of knowledge, you have different knowledge frames and conceptualizations of the world. You have, of course, different gender politics and the politics of difference, which I will come to. You have different religions, norms, rituals, practices, cuisines, smells, etc., etc. And you have different communities of practice, different socialization, different hierarchies, different politeness systems, uh, and so forth. So uh, all of that falls under culture, and of course I cannot touch on all of that, uh, but my basic claim is that integration is much more than language competence. So the focus of all our societies now on, you, they have to learn German, English, French, and they don't really want to learn German, English, French, is sort of one tiny aspect, again, of the culturalization uh, of discourse. And what I would like to emphasize is a competence of plurality, uh, and I will come back to that later on. So just very briefly, I've written more about that in the paper, sort of definitions of what belonging culture, culturalization are, but I was very interested in David Miller's new book. I think it's very, very good and interesting. And uh, I refer to it in the paper, Anna. <laughs> and uh, where he talks about the civic cultures. And uh, basically what he does is he distinguishes between private cultures of immigrants and sort of the public culture of the society which they join. And then they have to cut off certain things and uh, they, you know, they just need to let things go if they come and we, sort of the host culture, have to also understand and <coughs> live with difference. And uh, he doesn't really say how that is supposed to work, but there's a very thin line of how to balance this. What do we accept, tolerate, respect, and you know, there are all these, uh, notions about this, and actually I was on a project with Anna on your advisory board about uh, this ACCEPT project. Uh, so there's a continuum, and of course the difference between public and private is also a very contested one from a feminist point of view. So, you know, there's much to say, but still I think that this new book is, uh, you know, maps out the field in a very interesting way. Uh, on the other hand, we have the notion of belonging, which was also mentioned yesterday already, and that's more the emotional ties when you really feel accepted in a community, which is not about citizenship, but about really belonging and having ties and feeling that you're part of this society, which of course means that you can also participate and vote, etc. So citizenship is very important. And the third uh, sort of approach, which uh, Yilmaz and uh, Soizal and others uh, endorse is very much that culture has become the dominant frame for political issues. So you don't talk about race anymore, you talk about culture. And it's about the culturalization. So these are the three concepts which kind of guide uh, what I have been writing about. So to give you an example, because I work with texts, and uh, I think it's important to see concrete data, uh, uh, I just want to show you what, in a focus group of Austrian-Turkish uh, young people, a young sort of Austrian-Turkish girl who was born in Vienna said, and I think she really shows this in-between, she doesn't belong anywhere. Uh, you can read the whole thing, but what I'm really interested is when she says, I do feel like being in between. I feel neither nor a foreigner, and when I go there, which is Turkey, they say I'm born there and here, and when I come here, then they say, I'm well, that I'm Turkish. So she doesn't know where she is, and the use of deictic forms, yeah, the here, there, and so forth, are very interesting in these kinds of experiences and narratives which uh, we have en masse in 42 fo focus groups in eight countries. It was a huge project which I was part of. 
On the other hand, I think it's very important to talk about non-belonging, and that also affects people of the society. I think that alienation is very much tied to non-belonging, and that's not only migrants. We can discuss that, but um, what we hear now in all this right-wing populist debates is we feel left behind, we don't feel uh, um, uh, represented anymore, we don't belong. So this belonging, non-belonging, I think is much more important than the concept of integration. Yeah? So that is one of my hypotheses. So for example, in Sweden, a Turkish woman said, when you walk around the city, people look at me, they don't want migrants to be seen, so they should work, but they should basically not be there. Uh, and we have hundreds of such experiences. Yeah? These are not just one cherry-picked, but uh, there are very many. So to go to gender politics and the politics of difference, uh, basically, the discourse about gender and gender politics <laughs> right now and the burkini and the burka <laughs> and the headscarf which are dominating our public sphere is the perfect example of this culturalization and the politics of difference and you focus on women. And I find that very interesting. You, they want to, men, white men want to discipline the female body. You see that also in the American fundamentalist discourses in the Tea Parties, but also Donald Trump is a perfect example right now. But you also see that in the right-wing uh, posters, I will not analyze those now, but you see it in the Swiss posters, you see it in the British BNP posters, and you see it in the Austrian. Uh, we protect free women, uh, so you can ask yourself what are free women and we were just talking on the bus, are they supposed to be almost naked if they are free? Uh, they so what the, they free. have to be naked. So, you know, what, what does this free mean? And what is the oppression which is constantly the subtext? And this polarization makes it very difficult for feminist Muslim women to actually be able to discuss the real oppression which exists, of course, also in these communities, because you're either or, you're for or against the headscarf. But that is just a symbol, and it could have just as well been men with beards. But you never have men with beards. You have, always have women with headscarves or burkas. And so the burkini scandal, which has dominated our headlines all summer after Nizza, and the terrorist attacks, and you all know that these policemen were trying to uh, get this woman to take off her clothes on the beach and be as naked or half naked or almost naked as the other people on that beach. Uh, that raised a huge scandal in the sense of why can't women just wear what they want on the beach? Uh, and basically, like a hundred years ago, many women and men actually wore such long uh, pants and, and stuff. And at the same time, you have the economic argument, which I find very interesting. For example, Marks and Spencers has huge websites uh, promoting burkinis and selling burkinis because you make a lot of money with selling this stuff. And uh, of course, you also have political announcements that for tourism, you should never forbid burkinis because the Saudi Arabian women uh, buy a lot of stuff. And we had a lot of interviews in the Austrian television from very nice touristic sites like Tel Amzee and uh, Salzburg and so forth, where the hoteliers said, oh, please don't forbid the burqa because we will lose all our customers. Now, of course, these are people who go away again. We were talking about that. They are tourists, but they're still in the city, and you see them. And they're also in the first district in Vienna because Austria basically has about 30 women with burka. So it's not really a big issue. But in the inner city in Vienna, you have many, many because they come and shop. Yeah, they're from Saudi Arabia or from the Emirates and so forth. So our foreign minister said, wearers of burqa leave a lot of money here, yeah, Sebastian Kurz. Or there are many op-eds from feminists who say, well, nobody cares if they are fully uh, veiled uh, or as long as their husbands leave a lot of money here. 
So the double standards are obvious, which doesn't mean that there are a lot of issues which we have to confront with Islam and certain uh, directions where women are oppressed. And I have a PhD student who's working about that and she calls that sexual textual oppression. I think that is a very good notion for this, but uh, not about talking about the burkini. Yeah, that's not really the interesting thing. So that leads me to one empirical study which we did uh, in Austria now about how, about the, the notion of non-willingness to integrate. And that has become a very important concept in the media and suddenly started, and we have looked in a huge corpus of media texts uh, with the software, suddenly started in connection with schools and children in schools. So if Muslim children were absent or female children were wearing headscarves or boys were disrespect disrespecting female teachers, this was called the unwillingness to integrate and was seen as the first step to radicalization. And so, just to show you, uh, when we analyzed this corpus, suddenly after Charlie Hebdo uh, and the terrorist attacks in France in beginning in January 2015, the use and the frequency of unwillingness to integrate went up like this. Before, that notion was only used by the far right. So suddenly this notion came into the mainstream uh, and became normalized. And now everybody's talking about people who are not willing to integrate, so they don't want to learn the language, they, uh, they don't want to go to the swimming classes, so it's all about culture. Yeah? And so that is why culture is so important in this debate and the culturalization uh, of discourse. And so basically what we see is uh, three kinds of integration right now. Integration through achievement, Leistung, that means, and that is basically what the Conservative Party is putting forward as a neoliberal concept. So if you achieve something, you are a success story, then you're allowed to stay. Yeah? Uh, the second one is integration through language, so you have the language tests, and I will come to this now in a minute, or integration through punishment. If you're not willing to integrate, that means you're not shaking the hand of your teacher, or you're not going to swimming classes, then you might have to pay fines of 1,000 or 2,000 euro. So these are the options which have now been mapped out in this cultural field. So I come to my second focus in this very brief sort of sum up of the massive area of culture, and that is monolingualism, multilingualism. Now, I'm just projecting this, as all of you probably know from the European Parliament and the European Council, that languages, all European languages form an integral part of European cultures. So that is a constitutive value. Uh, now that has changed a bit into skills. In the sort of neoliberal world, we're talking about linguistic skills, not anymore about languages, which you need to know if you want to succeed in entrepreneurial ways. But basically, we have the diversity of languages. So I just want to show you from another study about multilingualism. Unfortunately, you don't see the colors very well. Uh, a colleague of mine, Hans-Jürgen Krum in Vienna, has let children uh, draw themselves and color themselves where certain languages are situated in their body, because languages are part of your identity. They're enormously important. And you see that English, which is kind of this uh, Himbeer uh, red, is sort of the arms, whereas um, Turkish is here, that's really the body, yeah? And you see that different parts of the body are assigned to different languages. And I find that an enormously interesting way to map this multi-identity and multiple identities which are manifested language-wise. And we have, you know, an archive of such uh, 
uh, drawings. I'm showing that to show you different methodologies as well from the purely quantitative. So you probably all know that there is a common European framework of how, what, how languages are assessed. We have six levels from A1 to C2. I'm not going to go into that. Each country has a different language profile and the linguistic tests for citizenship uh, and in Austria and other countries also for entering the country at all, uh, you have to know A1, for example. There were huge debates in various countries about that. Sweden is still the only country which doesn't want that. Uh, otherwise, all countries have some combination of ABC, yeah? and it has also changed a lot over the years, and I elaborate that in my paper. There are very interesting uh, studies from the Council of Europe about that. One issue is that many of these tests, and I've actually brought two of them here, that many of these tests, and I can hand them around, maybe you want to see them, I've brought an example of an A1 and B1 test, are not made by linguists. They're made by administrators and bureaucrats who don't know anything about com communicative competence, and that's not good. For example, a friend of mine is helping two Afghan boys, and they live with them, and they came home from the German course and brought home what they're currently learning. And you wouldn't be, well, you wouldn't expect it, but they are learning to read Little Red Riding Hood. And they have to, as a homework, they have to actually look at which cases are used. Now, this is certainly not what you need when you walk in the streets of Vienna and want to know which tram to take, where to buy bread, or how to find friends. Yeah, you don't need to know Little Red Riding Hood. And uh, you might need to know other stories which might also connect with your culture. Yeah, that comes back to this intercultural communication. So, I think that applied linguistics should be called for much more in this area, and we've been talking about that for a long time, but um, are not very successful. Um, but what you do see is that measures are getting ever more strict uh, in most countries, and that there are different kinds of tests, and some countries pay language courses, in other countries you have to pay half the language courses, in other countries you have to pay all the language courses. There are huge differences. There is no standardized way in the EU how to deal with this. And the Council of Europe is, I think, the basic, the best site for that, and they have enormous amounts of fantastic materials. Uh, what I want to just point to uh, is that we now also have projects which show that the factor of migration is not the salient factor. And we are just currently conducting an empirical study of children from Turkey in Vienna and uh, sort of real Austrian children yeah, with native language of German. And uh, it's a longitudinal study of language acquisition from children from two to five. So kindergarten, home, they're being videotaped in interaction with their parents. Uh, they do uh, picture tests, storytelling, all kinds of things which you can do with little kids, vocabulary, uh, and so forth. And what we see is that children from high social status families, both Turkish and Austrian, are much better in language acquisition than the lower class children. And the Turkish kids are sometimes even better than the Austrian kids because the ambition and the orientation towards education is so huge. Yeah? Uh, if you come from a Turkish background where you come from a higher status family, where migration always means upwards mobility, or usually means, and you strive to get back to your social status, there is an enormous input at home, 
and the children are supported, encouraged, and get a lot of stuff to read, and there's a lot of text orientation. Whereas lower class families, both native Austrian and Turkish background, don't have that. So the social dimension overrides the factor of migration. And I think that is a very interesting study. There are very few studies of this kind where really case studies are made, matching families, etc. So it's a very labor intensive empirical way to study this, but I think it's very important and really shows uh, uh, the importance or uh, sort of how to look at various factors. And I, in my paper, I just summarized speech acts, but we're studying frequency of vic vocabulary, uh, sentence acquisition, and a lot of other uh, pragmatic factors. So basically, to sum up the language part of my um, uh, short uh, uh, talk here, uh, the Council of Europe says there is, there are five ways which migrants or refugees or five options. They can decide to stay with their repertoire, the language repertoire and their culture as, you know, this massive thing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, that means we will have parallel societies. Yeah, so segregation. They would want to wish to change their repertoire, but they are not able to do that because they sit around, they have no money, they, you know, they're not supported, they're not encouraged, and this is the group which should be targeted most. Then there are those who aim to functionally rearrange their repertoire, uh, but still stay in this Turkish or Afghan or Syrian identity, so, but they are waiting to belong, yeah? They are on the way to belong which leads to rearranging the linguistic repertoire, but still staying with uh, two languages, but possibly gradually dropping one, which is a huge shift in identity structure and might lead to, uh, you know, other socio-psychological problems. And sort of the ideal type is to rearrange the functional repertoire, but with two joint languages or even more. Yeah? So that would be the ideal type uh, which one should try to achieve. So just to end on a positive note, I wanted to uh, tell you of a very interesting attempt which is now being practiced in Vienna, uh, and that's the mobile intercultural teams called MIT, yeah, but not the university. And uh, those teams which um, consist of social psychologists, language teachers, therapists, social workers, uh, and various other, you know, important professions come when they're called for, yeah? And they're mobile, so you might have a difficult case of two Syrian kids in a school. Uh, the teachers could say, we need this team to come, yeah? And they would come and and stay and help and provide help and think about you know, on a case-for-case -case basis. Now, of course, again, this is costly, and of course, it's also, you don't have many of those, uh, but probably from the cost-benefit structure, they are very effective. Uh, and uh, I think as final sentence, we have to be very patient. Uh, what I've tried to map out is the uh, enormous complexity of this area of culture and also how it is being instrumentalized for political aims and to really achieve integration in the sense of a dialogue and of intercultural communication, of understanding each other and also sort of dropping and leaving things behind will take at least, as every, all experts say, 10 to 20 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>